New Days, Old Demons. We're live here in New York City. I've got my friend, Pastor Mark Driscoll. Welcome to the broadcast today. We're actually live right now, and I'm so glad to Dude, have you here. We just ate meatballs. We had Italian meatballs. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a wild day for you especially, yeah. so thank you. I really appreciate no, it. honored to be here. Good to meet yeah. your family, too. Yeah, we had a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah, this has been great. So we're filming for a movie. It's coming out in October. I'm not at liberty to say when exactly it's coming out, but you dropped some straight heat for this film, and I'm so glad for your contribution. Uh, many people who are watching right now are interested in the topic of demons. I talk about demons all the time. And no, I'm not demon-obsessed, but uh, we need to expose and uncover these things. So I want to jump in and just go real deep today. Is that all right? Sure. Okay, cool, cool. Uh, for those people who don't know who you are, I'm going to try to do... And that's most. <laughs> no, I, listen, get out of here. I, I would say, for those of you who are a part of my channel and you don't know, Pastor Mark Driscoll, uh, man, I've been following his his preaching for years and years, and you've got a book, and I'm just going to say this from the jump, because in the description, you can actually find the, the links for the book. It's New Days, Old Demons. Now, I'm going to read this, a study of Elijah, sex, gender, basically every word that's about to get me banned from YouTube, mm -hmm. uh, ancient paganism masquer masquerading as progressive Christianity, victims of nothing, woke politics, the transgender Jezebel spirit that castrates men, and the passive Ahab soft woke Christian beta male spirit leading the, the conga line to Sheol, carrying a rainbow flag. So I just wanted to start this video by alerting yeah. every moderator on YouTube. You're all triggered. <laughs> we, we, we believe in equality. Trigger everyone. Yeah, I just, yeah. equal opportunity <laughs> yeah, offender. Yeah, so yeah. now that I just machine gunned our entire audience. Yeah. So to tell me a little bit about this book. I mean, it's coming out, Is it, it's, it's pre-orders coming out next week. Yeah, I mean, uh, so I've got a ministry, uh, Real Faith, and we're, that's where it's coming from. It's not published with a publisher, so you can't cancel me. There's no endorsement, so you can't attack my friends. I'm not taking a dollar from it, so you can't question my motives. Right. And uh, it's just it's looking at the old story of Elijah, Jezebel, and Ahab. I'm in the middle of a sermon series I'll finish this weekend. And I was on break after Christmas getting ready to start the series, and I sat down and I just started working. I didn't have an outline. I didn't mm. think I was writing a book. And I ended up with this book. And so wow. I basically wrote most or almost all of it in one verbal processing 24-hour kind of Rain Man meets <laughs> Old Testament meets Rob Zombie in a haunted house <laughs> on Halloween yeah, yeah. with Alice Cooper kind of situation. And so for me, just kind of 30 years of Bible teaching all came together mm. in like a stream of consciousness Things I hadn't even thought about or connected came together. Yeah. Well, you've been dropping some massive revelations about the indication of how we're dealing with ancient disembodied spirits totally. that that have twisted personalities that are doing whatever they can to puppeteer our politics, puppeteer our I mean our church leadership. And so if you're okay, I just want to jump right yeah, yeah, in because I'm want. feeling yeah. a fire already. Um, you know, as a matter of fact, many of you who follow me, we've got over a quarter of a million subscribers on this channel. Channel, uh, You remember during the pandemic me taking you through the sequence of, hey, you can see, you know, Daniel chapter 5. And they you closed see the church in Daniel. They closed the church in Elijah. Yeah. COVID was the series of greatest false prophecies in the history of the world. Yeah. If false prophecy is predicting something that doesn't happen then COVID was the greatest series of false prophecies wow. in the world. And what you see in the days of Elijah, the government cancels, deplatforms, crucifies the real prophets, hires, pays, funds the false prophets, gives them a platform, and then they prophesy something that brings a spirit of fear. Yeah, yes. And then the entire nation is gripped with the spirit of fear in the days of Elijah. And in our day, it went global. The governments conspired together to hire the false prophets who showed up with their medical qualifications, telling us that the end of the world was coming, which was not true, and we needed to close the church, but we needed to keep the abortion clinics open because they're essential. Yeah. So so worship was not essential, but murder was. Wow. Yeah, just do this on my channel. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> but it's true. I mean, and you're not saying anything that I didn't say in the heart Those of New York facts. City. These are all facts. I mean, they told us two weeks to slow the spread. Yeah, and here we are. Flatten the economy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And so what we're seeing right now is a redefinition of right and wrong. I mean, we've got confusion in mass, yeah. and you've been a voice, really like a beacon that's just shining the light of Christ into this darkness. And what happens when you turn on the light in a cockroach-infested room is you realize you're not alone. Yeah. And I think that we thought that it was just humans against humans. No, it's not. And yet you turned on the light and said, wait a second, we're not alone. And so what, what is in operation in the world today? I mean, what are you seeing? You kind of started to diagnose it, but uh, what are we really dealing with? Because I know on the surface it's Republican versus Democrat, it's liberal versus conservative, but not, this gotta, isn't anything new. No, we, it's not left-right, it's north-south. And so it's like, are we going to invite heaven down or are we going to pull hell up? Because when all is said and done, there's only two cultures, and every culture lives between those cultures. Mm. So thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We invite the kingdom down or we pull hell up. This is not about left and right. This is about good and evil. Wow. Mutilation of children is not a left-right issue. It's a good and evil issue. Truth versus lies is not a left-right issue. It's, uh, it's a good evil issue. Church open or closed. Um, church free to worship or under government restrictions is not left and right. It's north and south. It's good and evil. It's heaven and hell. Wow. And so I think most Christians need to get out of the election paradigm and get into a kingdom mindset. Wow, that is amazing. So we're, okay, we're talking about abortion, for example. Some people would like to think that that's a problem of the last 60, 70 years. Mm -hmm. But we know that there's a biblical template that this is an ancient demon in operation. Totally. So what do you see biblically, and, and what are the patterns that are replicated here in 2023? So it goes all the way back to King David. God tells him, you're a king. You're under the king of kings. Here's your job description. And then his son decides, I'm going to violate what the king of kings says, and I'm going to take wives that aren't believers. And so he you know, racks up a thousand you know, women plus concubines. I don't know why yeah. a dude with a thousand wives needs concubines. I can't <laughs> imagine the, I don't get any quality time conversation on day night. <laughs> And, uh, and he marries women who worship false gods from surrounding nations. Mm -hmm. uh, Molech, Chemosh, uh, Ahab, and Jezebel bring into the nation of Israel uh, Baal and Astra worship. Yeah. And all of that started with um, Solomon. And so here's the big idea. If you worship the wrong God, then you have power to do evil. Mm. If you worship the right God, you have power to do good. And so what happens wow. is they start worshiping sex. And, and in the days of Solomon, he has no boundaries on his sexuality. And then that comes into the nation. And next thing you know, uh, Baal and Astra is a male and female God. They're worshiped through sex. The result is that you have children. And then you sacrifice your children to the demon god Moloch or Chemosh. And it was funded by the government. So state-funded, I'm telling you, pro-choice yes. is the name of a demon. And state-funded abortion started with sacrificing your children to Moloch. Yes. And so today we would say that we're very, very advanced. No, we're not. We're just, we're just pagans in denial. Yeah, right, right. Pagans with technology. Yes. With new technology. So, and I just want everybody to hear what he's saying. You, some of you are going to have to rewind, watch this several times over to get into you. So it's governmental. So it's state it's sanctioned. It's always God versus government. Yes. And prophets versus politicians. Wow. That's Daniel. That's Elijah. Every prophet is God versus government, politician versus prophet. And what happens is to this is where the church lost its anointing is if you speak for the government, you're no longer a prophet because a prophet never speaks for the government. He speaks to the government. Wow. Thank you for making that distinction. Because Elijah keeps putting his finger in the chest of Ahab. Daniel keeps putting his finger in the chest of a series of kings. Mm. And what happened during the last uh, go round with COVID, people, well, the government says, the CD says, you know, the F word Fauci says, mm -hmm. you know, here's, and what they're doing, they are speaking for the government, not to the government. And wow. that's when you go from being a prophet to a politician. Yeah. And as soon as you're a politician instead of a prophet, God takes his hand off you. There is no anointing. You are on your own. Mm. And then the only power you potentially have 
is demonic because Satan wants to help you speak for the government, not to it. Wow. This is okay. This is so rich. So let's kind of transition now because I want to keep diagnosing if you're okay with that. And, and for those of you who are like, I, I love these kinds of conversations. I want more information on this. Not only did I link to his channel in the description, but again, his book, New Days, Old Demons, is linked in the, in the chat as well. It's a full sermon series. I'm yeah. going through first and second kids. Yeah, because this, this is something where in V1 Church, we, we took that journey. I mean, people were getting their mind blown to say, wait a second, this is a spirit of Herod all over again. They, they, there was a let's kill the firstborns, and you see that over and over again, echo. Mm -hmm. And so there's something about tracing that echo and saying, and this is my, my, one of my favorite Mark Driscoll lines, you know, the Bible isn't the story of what happened, it's the story of what always happens. And it's not just because God doesn't change, but it's also because Satan's rolling out and his demonic minions the same strategy over and over. And that's why cessationism to me is so insane. What they're saying is Satan and demons had certain powers and God and angels and the Holy Spirit had certain powers and God has decided not to use all of his powers, but Satan and demons are. Satan and demons are not cessationists. <laughs> Furthermore, um, Satan and demons, if they are continuing to use everything in their arsenal and God is not, then we should all put a cup and a helmet on before we go to bed because it's hopeless. Right, right. I mean, Satan is going to do everything he's ever done, and I hope God does everything that he's always done. Yeah, come on. Well, and I, I say this, whenever you see the prophets of Baal, there's going to be an Elijah. So the hope that I have in this era, I mean, we're here in New York City, and the hope that I have when I see the prophets of Baal, and maybe you could talk a little bit about this, because wherever you have a god or a demonic entity represented as a god, you're going to have prophets of that god. Totally. And so there's God's prophets, and then there's the prophets of Baal. And when I when I look at this woke ideology, to me, those are spirit. prophets of that god. It's a spirit. So wokeism is just a spirit. Yeah. And so, you know, certain on the left will be like, you can't even define it. Right. Because it's powers, principalities, and spirits. Yes. And what we're not talking about is an ide ideology, but an entity. Yes. Yes. And anytime you see church closed, lies promulgated, you know, Bible teaching canceled, throttled, anytime you see children mutilated and government seizing authority over parents, you know that something from the dark side of the force is at work in the world. Yeah. Yeah. And wherever you have an entity, you'll have profits of that entity. And what I find is so alarming is how people are literally standing on the side of these issues and using their social media, their influence. And some of them are even Christians. And I know you used the word soft woke, which since we're talking about woke, I'd love to get a definition of soft woke. So hard, because it's interesting yeah. to me, people won't use hard their... woke is out of the closet. Soft woke is in the closet. Okay. It's the opposite yeah. of the gay community. The mm. soft woke is the don't ask, don't tell. Wow. So they are going to go nuts for justice, but not justice for the unborn. They will go crazy for Black Lives Matter, which is an anti-God, anti-patriarchy shell game for, you know, socialistic redistribution of wealth through power. But they won't say anything about the unborn. And uh, and at the end of the day, it's not just what they say, it's what they don't say. Yeah. And And so the soft woke has taken over the majority of evangelicalism. And it is, my goal is not to get fired or in trouble. It's like most of the guys that I respect got murdered. And it says this in Revelation. There's a line in Revelation that's haunting. It talks about outside of the city of the New Jerusalem, the people who aren't allowed into the kingdom, the idolaters, the sexually immoral, the witches, and the cowards. Yeah. And so a coward is not fit to be in leadership. And we tend to evaluate whether or not somebody is qualified by how nice they are and how many people like them. Mm -hmm. And you can't be a prophet and have high approval ratings. If you're a prophet, it's always going to be one in five yeah. star reviews. That's how it's going to go. Yeah. And and Baal always has false prophets. It says that there were 850 false prophets yes. in Baal and Astra in the days of Ahab and Jezebel in First and Second Kings. And it says that they dined at her table, meaning this, they were paid. Yeah. And so... A lot of guys are like, what will pay the bills? What will give me clicks? What will give me likes? What will give me influence? What will give me promotion? Yeah. What will give me job security? Mm. And so at the end of the day, if you're ultimately living for that, Jesus says you're living for a demon god called mammon. It's back to a demonic issue. Yes, yes.
And I, I want everybody listening right now to understand, and, I, and here's what I hear you saying, and I just want to put the implicit into the explicit. There, there's no such thing as three teams. It's not team God, team Satan, and then myself. It's you, if you are not actively working on behalf of the kingdom of heaven, you are working on behalf of You're the enemy. You're for me or against me. Yeah, exactly. That's what Jesus said. Because I think that soft woke is like, well, how do we bow to Nebuchadnezzar's idol, but then still pray three times? Yeah. And then that way we don't get killed for it. Well, Maybe it, we'll. It's trying to straddle the yeah. fence. Yeah. And the only thing that happens is a chafe crotch. <laughs> Come on, guys, quote him. <laughs> Put that on Instagram and tag Pastor Mark Driscoll. <laughs> yeah, but it's true because I think what happened was that one of the blessings of the last couple of years is things get so blatantly shoved in your Dude, face. It, it is, forces you to take a stand. It used to be demons would sneak around, and now yeah. they're just walking around. Yeah. I mean, yeah. when you've got you know Methodist pastors hosting drag queen story hours on the altar— you're like, uh, is this the abomination that causes desolation? I mean, it it, it used to be less obvious, and then yeah. people could deny it, but now they're not even ashamed. Right, right. It, well, and I always find it embarrassing that they're not ashamed. They're going out we're there doing it, the but we're ashamed of the gospel. And it's like, you know, I think some of you watching right now, you need to come out, come out of your Christian closet and say, I am a believer. I believe that the word of God is true. And there's just something about that, that I, in, in this time, it's provoking the Daniels and the Shadrachs and Meshachs and Abednego's to, to actually say, no, I'm, I'm going to take a stand. But the Bible says that the gospel is offensive, but it's offensive in an attractive way. Yeah. Because your whole life, you're told you're good. And then you're like, no, you're not. You're like, right. well, that's offensive, but it's curious. Mm. You're the problem, not the solution. You're the villain, not the victim. Yeah. Um, when people hear those things, they're offended. But it's like, you know what? The only thing that has been constant in your life is you. So maybe your worst enemy is you. Yeah. And maybe yeah. you need to be saved from you, which means you can't save yourself. Yeah. And, and so the gospel of Jesus Christ is bad news before good news, sinner before Savior, offensive in a way that really is inviting to make sense of reality. Yeah. And what we're dealing with now is an entire culture that is just saying that biology is bigotry and that reality is, you know, discriminatory, which yeah. is insane. Because reality is like gravity. Whether or not you believe in it, you have to deal with it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's irrevocable. Well, here's the thing, though. It's it's like we've we've given people permission to divine themselves, and I think Which only— Which is a counterfeit of God. It, it Everything is. Everything God creates, Satan counterfeits. Yes, Yes. And so a father assigns identity, identity, a father releases identity. It's like, you know, and I think when, when I think about the American ideology, it's create your own identity. But I, in Christianity, your identity isn't created, it's inherited. It's not achieved, it's, it's received. Yes. And so it's like, it's crazy because, you know, and Pastor Mark, maybe you can say something about this, but in, anxiety levels are increasing. Mm -hmm. They have a form of freedom and yet they're heavily medicated and they're anxiety ridden. And I, from my pulpit, I've been preaching for years. Could the source of the anxiety be the burden of creating your own identity? What if your identity was received, not achieved? What if what if you didn't have to make your future? What if it was already planned yeah. and you have to be led into it by your maker? And and so what does that look like? And because we're defining our own. I don't give a crap about being good. It's more important to be loved. Yeah. And we live in a world where everybody is trying to pretend that they're good. And if you say that they're bad, then they're triggered and offended and a victim. The good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is you're not good, but you're loved. Yeah. And, and the nice thing about an identity that is rooted and sourced in God's unchanging love is it's an unshakable identity. Mm. So like Jesus at the beginning of his ministry, the father speaks from heaven and says, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. And the answer is, well, what did he done? He hadn't preached a sermon. He hadn't yeah. cast out a demon. He hadn't performed a miracle. Jesus lived from the Father's love and approval and mm -hmm. identity, not for it. Yeah. And there's something profoundly liberating when who you are is at the starting line, not the finish line. Yeah. And you work from it and not for it. Like, I've got five kids, and when I first held my uh, oldest son, he's now 23, I held him, and i never forget, like, I, it wasn't... If you perform, yeah. I will love you. 
you will be my son if you meet this job description. I held him and I was like, this is my son. And I literally said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Yeah. And I prayed for him and I prayed for his son. And, uh, and my son crapped on my foot. <laughs> I was wearing open toed sandals. He was naked. Yeah. And welcome. he crapped on my foot. Yeah. And I thought, welcome to the world. This is the gospel. Yeah. My father loves me mm. and I take a dump on him. And he laughs because he loves me and I'm his son. Yeah. If if the average person walked up and took a dump on my foot, I would not have laughed and considered that appropriate behavior. <laughs> but a son yeah. gets to do things that the father knows are part of his development. Yeah. That being said, now my son is uh, having uh, a son next month. Wow. And I'm going to meet my grandson. Congratulations. And I will hold my grandson. And I will pray the same thing over my grandson that I prayed over his dad. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. I can't love him anymore. I won't love him any less. On his good day, I'm going to encourage him. On his bad day, I'm going to carry him. Yeah. And that's the father heart of God. And, yeah. and if you know that, you live differently. Now, if you do think, I'm the center of the universe, not God, that my destiny is determined by my choices, and also I need to create an identity, and then I need to continually live up to it, you are going to be crushed under the weight yeah. of being the center of your own universe and the source of your own identity. Yes. Yes. Now, having established all that, because I, that's the foundation for this next part I want to jump into, and you just masterfully laid out the gospel in the Father's heart, because we have uh, an increasingly growing list of pronouns. We've got yeah. a, an entire Mine's spectrum. Mine's WTF. Of... <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> Let me uh, hold that for a second. We'll get that meeting in a second. <laughs> yeah. How many strikes can we get <laughs> before they shut us down? But but it's like you know, increasingly growing list of pronouns. We have sexuality on a spectrum, and I mean, to be honest with you, here in New York City, I mean, the the pride flag in and of itself has become a farce. I mean, it continues to expand by color, symbols, even people within the community. If you told me, tell me what everything represents on this entire flag. I mean, it, it's just, it's becoming, it's beyond absurdity, right? Yeah. So what do you say? Where do you see in the Bible, though, a template for, oh, Pastor Mike, this is something new. No, 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 this is something old. Because obviously people who have not heard the gospel don't understand the gospel. They're going to try to create their own identity. And in a society that values uniqueness, okay, I'm a cat now, yeah. you know, because I'm more unique than you. And, and my teacher has to oblige by putting a litter box in the classroom because I'm more unique than the other 29 people. Yeah. And so in an individualistic society, in a society that creates your own identity, in a society that values uniqueness over community. Why, though? Yeah. Like, why Why is being a snowflake valuable, purposeful, yeah. meaningful? Like, you're a dude, you know, you pee standing up, yeah, and uh, you eat meat and grow up and get a job and buy a house that a woman wants to live in, and then you can have sex. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. it's very nice when... You know, I, I would hate it if I went to Ikea and they gave me a blank sheet of paper <laughs> for assembling all the furniture. I would be very stressed by that. <laughs> That's so good. <laughs> that is so good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like God made me. He wrote a book. Wow. And he tells me how to put my life together. I don't oh, have to be so smart. Good. I just got to sequence the steps and crank the little wrench. I mean. Yeah. Oh, this is so good. I know this is funny, but it, it, it really is that simple. It Wow. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> the team behind me is like cracking up because you just blew our minds with an Ikea illustration. But you're right, it would be paralyzing. Oh, yeah. And you're it's right. like... It's, like, how do you want to put the furniture together? <laughs> it could be a coffee table or it could be a, a helicopter. Yeah. You're just yeah. like, I'm so stressed out. I need meds. <laughs> <laughs> you're right yeah yeah right it's a coffee table step yeah. one yeah. yeah and all of these parts that are in the box came together by random chance yeah. anyways yeah yeah yeah, yeah they, all, they know, all evolved yeah they all evolved into these perfectly cut pieces yeah. that look as if they have some semblance of yeah, order. and then you put it all together and you're like you know what it doesn't work uh it's it's ridiculous but now i need to tell everybody that that to me, it's a coffee table. It's yeah. not a coffee table. Yeah, it's a disaster. <laughs> this is it may so identify good. as a coffee table, yeah. but it's a disaster. <laughs> the legs are going the wrong way. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's just. Yeah. 
But that's what we do. We take a whole generation and we're like, you're free to be God. And they're like, I am breaking under the weight of that responsibility. Shh, that is so good. Real quick, guys, please hit the thumbs up. That tells the algorithm to send this video to more people before it gets taken down. <laughs> Share it with as many people as possible. Um, okay, so let's talk about, and, and you, this is connected, let's talk about Ahab and Jezebel. Okay. Because I spent about six months diagnosing and, and dialing, hey, here's what we see in culture, and then you started talking about it and actually took it to a whole nother level because I believe that we are dealing with a Jezebelic infrastructure, Jezebelic culture. Jezebel's controlling. Ahab yeah. is, so Ahab yeah, break is this passive. Down. Jezebel is controlling. Yeah. Elijah is assertive. Yeah. So Ahab, so what happens is if you tolerate, they will dominate. And so that's where Jesus comes in Revelation 2, a thousand years after Ahab and Jezebel and Elijah. And he says to the church at Thyatira, this I have against you, you tolerate that woman Jezebel. Now, everything God creates, Satan counterfeits, the opposite of repentance is tolerance. Wow. And so if you have sin, if you preach tolerance, you cannot preach the gospel. Mm. If you, The only way to preach the gospel is to preach repentance. So Ahab always preaches tolerance, and then Elijah comes along and preaches repentance. And so you're going to be passive or assertive or controlling. And what happens to most people is they, they start either Jezebelian or Ahabian. They start passive or controlling, and they go to the other. Yeah. So you're controlling, and you're like, well, I have no friends, no relationship. No one wants to do life with me. I'm like, it's like, you know, having a relationship with a vice grip that just, yeah. you know, every day the vice just sort of squeezes a little more. So now I'm not going to have any opinions. I'm not going to say no. I'm going to celebrate everything. Wow. I become Ahab. Ahab's like, I said yes to everything. I was tolerating and passive and I got run over and taken advantage of. Wow. I'm going to make an inner vow, maybe even put it on my kids and make it a generational curse. We will be in control. We will make the decisions. No one's going to tell us what to do. Most people go from Ahab to Jezebel. Elijah shows up, he's assertive. And what he's doing is he's getting a word over and over from the Lord. And so Elijah hears from the Lord and speaks from the Lord. He rebukes Ahab and Jezebel. Mm. And I would say today, even within Christianity, high controlling, cessationistic, legalistic, fundamentalistic environments are more Jezebelian, progressive, liberal, tolerant, fly the rainbow flag, come out of Satan's closet churches, are Ahab, and they're fighting with each other, and they're both wrong because they're not Elijah. Yeah, Elijah calls everyone and everything to repentance. He's assertive, not domineering, and he doesn't always look for the fight, but when the fight comes, he's willing to have it. Yeah. Well, let me pause there for a second because you just spoke on something I was hoping you would mention. It, 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 okay, so Elijah is not provocative. No. Elijah's not clickbait. Elijah's not like Elijah's not trying to build his fame off of a uh, controversy. He preaches and goes to the woods and disappears. Yes. Okay. He doesn't do the tour. He's not signing books. Yeah. Be, He's yes. not selling T-shirts. He doesn't have his face with hope. You <laughs> yeah, know. Word. Yeah. I mean. So to hide the Pastor Mark <laughs> shirts we made. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, but I'm glad you said it because it's like. I, I think what happens is Satan comes masquerading as an angel of light and will convince you that you're Elijah when actually you're not. And I think no. there's a group of people, and this is what I love about you. I truly feel like you you do represent Elijah in that context. And you know, I can say that about you here in this, which is why we have you in the movie. This is why you're here with me now. But what I've seen is the trap within Christianity. And they say, we're not cessationists, but we're also not woke. And we're Elijah, and it's like, no, you're you're Elijah with a marketing plan. You're Elijah, you know what I mean? You, yeah. And you've actually compromised, not you, but these people have compromised the prophetic by trying to uh, basically monetize it and make an em build an empire off of it. So it's like, I'm not going to help Ahab and Jezebel build their empire, but I'm not building the kingdom. I'm actually building my own empire. Yeah. And then, and and so in, and I say this too, but it's like Satan's in the blessing business too. Oh, totally. So, and there's a lot of people that rode that wave, and it's more of like this political, ideological Christianity where they're hiding the cross under the flag. Yeah. And now that we have another problem now, you know? And so, what would you say to those people? Uh, and I know this is kind of off the cuff, but, you know, that, that maybe are looking at this saying, because you said something, you said they're not looking, you know, a real Elijah is not looking for the fight, but prophetically will speak the truth into it. And I find what's happening among the millennial and Gen Z, and if they're watching right now, I'm hoping I'm, I'm cutting them with the truth, is they are 
waiting for it. It's almost to the point where they couldn't live without the controversy, and they're going to they're gonna potentially self-sabotage some things just to generate enough publicity to keep growing their platforms. Well, that's the problem. So uh, some years ago, I was doing a radio show with Dr. Drew, Love Line, yeah, yeah, Sex yeah, Call yeah. Guy. This was a long time ago. And, and I was co-hosting with him, and we started taking sex calls. From It was not awkward at all. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> we were having a conversation in the break, and he ended up writing a book on it. Um, he called it The Mirror Effect. And he talked about a culture of narcissism, which is interesting. Mm. And what he says is that celebrities will model, and then followers will mirror. Wow. So that becomes reality television and celebrity culture and social media. So if somebody is a celebrity and they do something and then their followers mirror it, number one, that's an act of worship. That's imaging. Wow. It's imaging and reflecting. Um, and then also what happens is as soon as everybody does it, it's no longer noteworthy. So then the influencer needs to do something more extreme. Mm -hmm. And then there's this constant competition to see who can become the most outlandish. So you end up with the Kardashians. You're like... Somebody got a boob job. They all got a boob job. Yeah. Dad got a boob job. You're like, I mean, like, next thing you know, like, you yeah, know, we have a male parakeet who's getting a boob job. I mean, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know where we go. Yeah, yeah. But it's like you just need to keep outperforming yourself, and and then you have a culture of idolized, demonized. Quote Jonathan Edwards: "Those you yeah. idolize, eventually you demonize." And Americans love the comeback story. Yeah. So you were up there, we tore you down, then you made your way back, and so this is all just part of the cultural wow. narrative in the West. Yeah. You need to continually outdo yourself until you are canceled and brought down, and then you need to make your comeback. And it's cliche at this point. Yeah. And and part of it is, you if you're thinking what will work, you're asking the wrong question. The question is, what is worship? Wow. Because work yeah. is what will give me glory. Worship is what will give him glory. And you caring is not worship. This is so rich. I, I believe that there are millions of people who need to hear that message because right now, as soon as you find out that you can make money off of social media and you can build your influence, there, there's people, I'm telling you, there, which in and of itself becomes Jezebelic. You totally. know what I mean? So it's like now you're working for Jezebel her thinking works. you're exposing her. You think you're exposing Jezebel, but you're working for Jezebel. Totally. And we talked about this earlier, but Jezebel had nobles that went on letter writing campaigns to destroy Naboth. Dude, they're influencers. And they're all part of an ecosystem of boosting one another, clicking one another. You know, and yeah, and, and was it First Kings 19? She goes to murder Naboth, and she just lies. She, she finds yeah. worthless men, and they're, you know, most of them are in their 20s in their mother's yeah. basement drinking Bud Light out of a sippy cup as we speak. <laughs> and she hires the worthless men, and the worthless men false testify, which yeah. happens all the time. Yes. And they write formal letters. Oh, well, it's very official. And then they accuse Naboth, the good, decent guy, of cursing God. And so they even weaponize the word of God. So Jezebel will weaponize the word of God. She will hire the false prophets, and she will create influencers and a PR kit to get the job done. Oh, this is so good. Yeah, well, and, and you know, like you said, they were looking for an opportunity, and they probably celebrated the fact, hey, Jezebel hit us up. This is our chance. We're in the inner circle, you know? And I'm seeing that more and more where it's just like you have these Jezebel networks that are in operation, all building each other's influence to go on letter writing campaigns to cancel people or to work against them. And so I just wanted to kind of bring a different perspective to that, but you know? But to work for Jezebel, you got to be castrated. Yes, I was just so going there. In 2 Kings 9, when they go to arrest Jezebel, it says she paints her face and she's going to try and seduce him. Yeah. So to the very end, she's like, you know, maybe I can sleep my way out of this. And it says that she was surrounded by her quote unquote eunuchs. And so if you want to work for Jezebel, you just need to be a castrated, neutered man. Yes. You literally transition right into where I was going. So I mean, let's can't talk use about the word transition anymore, brother. It's out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Somebody's getting delivered yeah. in the chat right now. <laughs> so because where else do we see castration? Uh, other Daniel than got castrated. Yes. So anytime there's a Babylonian, the spirit of Babylon, the spirit of Jezebel, it castrates. And here's a, here's a weird rabbit trail. It's in the New Day's Old Demons book. So I was doing this kind of, you know, rain man mind melt. And I stumbled onto the history of religions. And it's this 
quarterly journal out of, I think it's the University of Chicago, completely non-Christian, completely secular, and they traced the history of transgenderism in multiple world religions, epochs of history, including drag queens in religious environments, and it included the days of Augustine, the church father, who was arguing against it in Rome. And so I follow it, and they're talking about, it's so interesting because in these various religions and spiritualities and ideologies and times and places and nations and languages, we see this constant thread of castrated transgender men who are worshiping a female deity. And they said, it's mind melting. I'm you know, using my language because these religions and people groups never met or intersected. We have no way of explaining this trend throughout history. It's like new days, old demons, people come and go, but powers, principalities, and spirits remain. And here's the, here's the mind melt. Oh, so I think good. this is what Paul was going after in Galatians. He opens in chapter one. He asks, who has bewitched you? It's literally cast a spell, witchcraft. And then he says, um, why don't you go all the way and castrate yourself? In their day, the goddess Cybele was the female deity. And if you wanted to be a priest for her, like Jezebel, you had to castrate yourself wow. and become a drag queen. And so the legalists who were fighting over circumcision in Galatians, I think Paul is saying, you guys are legalists, and if you keep going, you are going to be Jezebelian. You're going to be Cybelian. You should go all the way and castrate yourself. And so today, if you want, and so I believe there's a demon called Spectrum. Yeah, yeah. Talk about that. And yeah. I believe that um, that the powerful force at work in the world today is to to try and convert an entire generation to mutilate themselves. And I believe that everything that God creates, Satan counterfeits. And so it's like, God gives me an identity as male or female. No, God failed me. I will repent of his sin against me by shedding my blood and cutting my flesh to liberate myself into my new life. And I think woke is the counterfeit of being born again. Wow. And, and I, can't, I can't help but to think about the prophets of Baal they're calling down fire. And they're cutting and themselves. And they cut themselves. It's all counterfeit. It, it's a counterfeit covenant. It is. It's blood is being spilled. I'm mutilating and cutting myself. Wow. You talk about these uh, transgender surgeries where people are, are you know, having surgeries. It essentially is covenant, which we know goes harkens back to witchcraft. So cutting. So when you t talk of covenant theologically, wow. the language is literally the cutting of a covenant. Yeah, it is. And covenants in the Bible were um, they were solemnized by cutting, bloodshed. This is covenantal. Transgenderism is a covenantal entering into a demonic alliance, and it is the counterfeit of Jesus Christ shedding his blood in our place for our sins, being cut in his body for us to be in covenant with him. And then, and then think about this. After we receive the gospel, we become a new creation. Mm -hmm. So covenant and then a new identity. They cut, enter into that covenant, and now I have a new identity. You know, as a new gender, as a new whatever. And I'm not born again. I'm woke, which is the counterfeit of being born again. Oh. This, I felt the atmosphere shift in the room as we were talking about that because you're here in the belly of the beast. You're in New York City. You've got a significant New York City-based audience watching right now, and I believe that we just exposed in a major way some demonic infrastructure that's at play. I mean, we've unfortunately had people attend our church and come in who, under the age of 18, who have gone through that process and regretted it dreadfully. And you're on medication for the rest of your life, fighting the gravity of your biological nature. And at the end of the day, let's just be honest, even the Pew research uh, would indicate that the majority of people who are struggling with gender dysphoria, which is a clinical condition that yeah. did exist until recently, and that is my body and my mind are incongruent. So now I have one of two choices. Well, I actually have one of three choices. I could change my body, I could change my mind, or I could get help for my trauma and see how I feel. Yeah. And the majority of people, according to Pew Research, that struggle with gender dysphoria have trauma, oftentimes sexual trauma. 
And I believe that sometimes demonic oppression is transferred with trauma. Yeah. That it's not just the body, especially in sexual sin. I mean, Paul's very clear that when we have sex, that our soul is involved, not just our body. And so if there is violence to the body, is it not possible that there's also oppression to the soul? Yeah. And if so, then people need to mentally heal from their trauma, but they may need to spiritually be delivered from their oppression and also just physically heal from their abuse. And and the point is this, why would we let someone who is the most broken make the most irreversible life-altering decision at the moment of their lowest mental health? Yeah, yeah. And then allow them to do that decision and restrict their parents' ability to even have a say-so So, so what it. happens is um, the counterfeit of the kingdom of God is the government. And yeah. government wants to overtake politics, economics, family, and church. And during COVID, successfully did so. And so even what happens in the days of Jezebel and Ahab and Elijah is that the government closes the believing schools and they open up public school. And so literally public school isn't public school, it's government school. Yeah. And so what has happened now is through the educational system, the government has weaponized the educational system to brainwash and disciple your children to be committed to the counterfeit of the kingdom of God, which is the kingdom of state. Yeah. Yes. And every school, and you know this. And every if a parent disagrees, then the government seizes authority. Yes. Even though the Bible says, honor and obey your mother and father, children are now the right of the state, not the mother and father. All of this is against the word of God, and we're down to a religious liberties issue. Yeah, we're destroying the hierarchy of authority that God ordained and set up. And then the school is a church. It's just the church of secular humanism. Yeah. So it's like the religion that your kids learn in a public education system is a religion called secular humanism, which means humans are the source of all problems, which means we're the source of all solutions. And that's what it's like, hey, I have a problem. I'm going to go get a surgery and fix it. Hey, I have a problem. I'm going to fi-. And so the gospel is I can't fix it. I, I'm not the source I'm of the, the solution. I'm the villain, not the victim. I'm the problem, not the solution. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's like, really, the gospel is antithetical to the whole, and I'm using the word religious, but it is a religious infrastructure so in right the now, schools. It, right now, what has happened is we, we've gone from tolerating to celebrating. Yeah. And unless you endorse and affirm, you are a bigot. And it's like, okay, so now what we're doing is we are evangelizing a generation. I mean, it's Jew. Yes. This yes. Is, this, is, this is evangelism month on the earth. Yeah. For an ideology that is anti-God. And endorse and and affirm is worship. (laughs) Like when you endorse, you're saying, I stand with Jehovah, the God Almighty, or I stand... So affirmation and endorsement is a form of worship. Completely. And so it's like, you're right. And I think pluralism in the U.S. used to mean you can believe what you believe, I believe what I believe, and let's settle at that. But like you said, we've moved past pluralism into hyper affirmation. So the dictionary has changed the definition of tolerance in the last few decades. Yes. From we disagree and there is some sort of truth. You could be right. I could be right. We both could be wrong to we're both right. And there is no truth. And, and so where we've gotten to at a point now is when you eliminate truth, all you have left is the father of lies. Wow. It's all demonic. Yeah. And so, Lying, disinformation, misinformation, it's demonic. Yeah. Wow. This is so rich. Uh, here, I know we're, we've been going for quite a while. I just want to kind of ask you a few more questions as we come to a close, because right now there's probably many of you watching thinking, like, I need to d- I need to go deeper. I'm an old-school Bible guy. I yeah. teach through books of the Bible. I've been doing so for 30 years. Yeah. I'm a Bible teacher. And, and yeah. if you follow the Word of God, you end up at some of these conclusions. Absolutely. And that's what we were talking about earlier. I don't wake up saying, how can I be provocative? I'm not the Howard Stern of Christianity looking no. for more Just content. Just read Romans 1 <laughs> anywhere outside of your house yeah. and watch the feces and fan interface. Yeah. You know? It's so true. It's so true. But at the same time, and I, I take so much comfort in this, it's like it's so dark. It's start it's starting among some people getting obvious that we have a problem and it's not working. And <laughs> the, yeah, you know, it's just starting yeah. it's start it's the beginning phases of saying, wait a second, something's fatally flawed. 
and we need another answer. And I do think we have the conditions for a massive revival right now because, and this is... Well, it's, e it's either a revival or a self-cleaning oven. That's yeah. where we are. <laughs> yeah, tell me about it. <laughs> well, there's two righteous in New York. I, I don't know if it's us or the team, but so we probably won't get flamed today. But, but you know, it's, it's one of those things where... I, and I, it's it's the people from the LGBTQ community in my church who are leading others to Christ, yeah. who came mm -hmm. out of that community who are saying, I've experienced the gospel, and I'm telling you, they're, they're telling you this but is the hope. people aren't but, our enemy. Yeah, Jesus that's said, it. said, you know, I've come to set captives free. That's it. If this is a spiritual war, then people have been brainwashed. They have been held as prisoner of war. And if you grow up in a world where it's constant war that's all you ever know. You don't understand what the oppression that you've grown up under yeah. until you escape it. And so hear me in this. I don't dislike anyone. Yeah. I want to see captives set free. I want to see people released from, to quote Colossians, delivered from the dominion of darkness to his glorious light. And so what I do get really frustrated in are the false prophets who will claim to be pastors and Christian leaders and the, so the soft woke cowards with the Ahabian passive spirit who will either tolerate things that are evil or will echo them. Yeah. Because yeah. that's not loving people. That's abusing and harming them. And all that is is loving yourself so that you don't have to pay any price for the preaching of the gospel. Come on. Yeah. And it's a high price. I mean, what happened to being willing to be persecuted? And I think if you became a pastor to be liked, you, you got in it for the wrong reason. Well, you know? and, and let's be honest, our persecution isn't that bad. I mean, no. this is a Nerf gun fight. Yeah, yeah. You know, in some places they're using real guns. Yeah. People are like, I got put in TikTok jail. It's better than real jail. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Real <laughs> jail might be a natural consequence coming up soon, yeah. but it's, it's like, I, I think... If anything, I hope my hope and my prayer for this broadcast is that people really were awakened to the fact that I need to take a stand. Because I'll tell you this, and I just want to encourage people watching, because it might be getting hot in the kitchen right now for some people who are like, man, I'm not used to this kind of talk. But I've looked people in their eyes, and I've said, let's talk about your sexuality. I've addressed trauma and pain from their past. Totally. And I've told people, you don't have to embrace that identity that the world gave you. I'm going to love you more than that community. And then I've heard things, Pastor Mark, like them saying, you know what? I've never had same-sex attraction. I just had effeminate characteristics because I never had a dad. Yeah, and they told me— inherited from a father. Yeah, and, 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 and I accepted too, the lie. We worship a virgin. Yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe you just keep your belt on until yeah. you get home. Yeah. Well, when you talk to people who are going out there and they're having rampant sex, and then they're glorifying but they're not anymore. it. They're just watching porn and they have ED. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah, that's a new phenomenon. But they'll glorify it because it was their decision. And the one person who has the courage to say that was a wrong decision it actually confirms their deeper conviction. Because there's a lot of people I've talked to who are like, I don't want to be this. Yeah, if you have a functioning conscience, that's, that's the downside of God making us. You can suppress the truth, but eventually your conscience gets you. Yeah, exactly. And that's why it's like a lot of people say, you know, at V1 Church, are you doing conversion therapy? And it's like, no, I'm preaching the gospel. And actually what happened is the Holy Spirit's already been working on them, and I'm not even telling them anything new. A lot of times I'm confirming what the Holy Spirit already said. Yeah. And they walk right through that door of freedom, and we've got people burning you know, makeup and, and wigs, and we're doing drag queen funerals, and people are getting free. But I'm not coming with anything new all the time. Sometimes it's just a confirmation of what they already know yeah. as to be truth, and they wanted somebody with enough courage to actually say it. But see, the sex is a religion now, and so is the identity. And that's Romans 1. You either worship creator or created. Yeah. That's it. And everybody's a pagan that's not a Christian. You're worshiping an idea that was created, a demon that was created, a business that was created. But then it says very curiously that the result of worshiping the created rather than the creator is sexual sin of every sort and kind, including the only express forbidding of lesbianism in the Bible, Romans 1, and approving of others and encouraging them to do likewise Pride Month. Wow. And so, you know, at the end of the day, if you stop worshiping the created and you start worshiping the creator, the first thing that starts to happen is that sexually you develop some measure of self-control and sanity. Mm. And so, you know, 
you know, I think it was uh, the old uh, British writer, um, G.K. Chesterton, he said, every man going into a brothel is looking for God. <laughs> you know, everybody right now who is watching porn, having sex, feeding the flesh, at the end of the day, they are looking for God and they are worshiping. And that's where Paul says to offer your body as a living sacrifice. Whatever you offer your body to as a living sacrifice is worship. That's why if you're sleeping with your girlfriend or you're a single dude, your bed is an altar, you are a priest, and that woman's body is a sacrifice being offered in worship to someone other than the God of the Bible. Everything is spiritual. Nothing is secular. Oh, man, that made me want to cry because there's just people do not, they're not aware of that. And the, and the world, and you know, isn't it just like the enemy to give us an, a completely different narrative to what you just said? Every Hollywood movie we've ever seen, every show, every pornographic scene, it's it shows the opposite of that. But when you, and this is why we did this broadcast, it's old demons and new days. And when you pull that veil back and say, no, actually, you just participated in pagan worship. It's like, I, I believe that drives people to repentance to say, that's not the identity I want. I thought I was receiving something else. But here's my last major question, because I'm saving some for the book. I'm, my hope and prayer is that many people get the book in addition to getting their mind blown during this broadcast. But the whole time we've been talking, and I know that I have many friends who are significant YouTubers who are watching this broadcast right now, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking the we have reserved freedom of speech for that entire community. And they, they, they can do and say whatever they want. Matter of fact, the, the truth is the algorithm will promote it. Totally. If I was, and, and now if, in the if back I, of mind, I'm if thinking. If I showed up in a dress, I would be like a cow in India. I could yeah. just walk around yeah. sacred and do what I want. Yeah. So in the back of my mind, I know. And there's been this unusual grace on my social platforms. I've gone viral on every platform, and, and God's gotten the message out. And yep. somehow or another, I, I've gotten accounts disabled and gotten them back, praise God. Uh, and that's me trying to give a rational, lucid, intellectual presentation of the scriptures, and I still have encountered that. Um, but in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, I'm having this conversation with you knowing all we're doing is perpetuating biblical truths, biblical values, mm -hmm. and yet freedom of speech minimally exists for me. Uh, what is the spirit behind that? The restriction of speech, the the, the silencing, the uh, making someone feel like they should become a coward or castration that, you know what I mean? Because because Elijah's direct and he has this boldness to speak into these totally. issues. But uh, what what is that Jezebelic? Is there something else? Well, part of it is the father of lies. Mm. Part of it is Romans 1 when it says that they will suppress the truth. Mm. Well, you know, that's throttling. That's cancel culture. I mean, the scriptures predict all of this. It says in the days of Elijah that they crucified, they, they killed all of the prophets of God. And today they can't crucify you, so they crucify your reputation, your platform, your revenue, your advertisers. Cancel culture is just a, it's a murderous spirit. And the day in which we live, it it is trying to drown out every voice so that there's only one voice left. And, and you look at it, in the days of Elijah, there's 850 false prophets against Elijah. And what's amazing is the odds are the same today. Wow. There's 850 liars for every truth teller. Um, but at the end of the day, the thing that made Elijah work, I mean, he goes to heaven before he dies. He comes down on the Mount of Transfiguration to visit with Jesus. They say in the end times, he's going to show up and preach and then they're going to crucify him, and he's going to resurrect, and then Jesus comes back. So even before we get a second coming of Jesus, we get a second coming of Elijah. Yeah. Because he prepared the way for the coming of Jesus the first and the second time. But you look at Elijah, and what he has is one thing. He has an anointing. Wow. He spends time with the Lord, he hears from the Lord, and he speaks for the Lord. And so the only way to overcome all of this is to live under God's anointing. And so it's it's not about your platform. It's about your anointing. It's not about your income. It's about your anointing. I mean, I get, I've been canceled. I, I started over in my 40s. I'll never forget I was at home, and I was kind of whining to the Lord. I would have called it prayer, but it was whining. And I was like, Lord, I, I don't have a job. I don't have a church. I don't have a book deal. I don't have a platform. I don't even have access to my social media accounts. I don't even have my passwords for like six months. I can't even defend myself. I said, I've lost everything. He's, he literally spoke to me. He said, you've not lost your anointing, and that's all you need. He said, if my anointing goes with you, you'll be fine. Mm -hmm. 
And so the key at the end of the day is, am I living in God's will? Not am I succeeding, not am I trending, am I obeying? Man, I almost cried during that. I think a whole generation needs to hear what you just said. Because winning isn't... Here's how a Christian needs to defend winning. I was obedient to the will of God for me. That's winning. And you're like, well, Jesus did that and got crucified. That was winning. That was winning. Yeah. You know, Naboth did that and got murdered and got his land stolen. And that was winning. You know, and so as long as you're obedient to God's calling on your life, you are successful. And it doesn't matter what the results are. What you just said cultivated real courage because it redefines. And there's a lot of people listening right now. Winning is how many likes, how many comments, how many shares, how many subscribers, Income, how much money in the bank footage, account. Yeah. Hotness of the spouse. Yeah. You know, the, the kids all look like they came right out of a gap ad and yeah. it looks good when we lie on the mom blog. Yeah. Yeah. And when you define winning that way, you'll compromise. If that's your definition of winning, you'll do whatever, you'll compromise, you'll you'll come into agreement with any demonic spirit you have to to get that. Totally. And, and the enemy will take you to the proverbial mountaintop and say, I can give you all this, and you'll take it. Yep. And Jesus was the one who passed on it and, and said, that, that's, that's not that winning. It. Yes. And he was also up on a high place. And wow. so within that, the goal at the end is to hear, well done, good and faithful that's servant. That's it. It's like, I gave you a job, you did your job. Yeah. Good job. Yeah. And for some people, their good job is you got fired. For some people, their good job is you got cancer. For some people, their good job is you got divorced. But if you're in the will of God, well done, good and faithful servant. Yeah. I'm telling you that message is not loud enough. <laughs> More people need to hear that. Well, there's reward eternally. You, you, yeah. And I always say you, you fight a spirit with an opposite spirit. Jesus said, I don't cast out Beelzebub by the power of Beelzebub. And so it's like you can't, you can't fight a demonic spirit that's puppeteering our politics and our local schools uh, with the same value well, system. And Jesus even said if you cast out a spirit, you don't replace the Holy Spirit, you get seven more spirits. Yeah. So that's different but not better. Yeah, Exactly. And I, I feel like so people just need to hear that. Unless it's the Holy Spirit, unless it is the power of God working in and through you to live a life of obedience to your calling. Yeah, yeah. It's like we have to be immune to what the devil can offer through the world, because we'll take the bait every time if we're not. And I think it's like, uh, I was saying this the other day, where there's a demand, there will be a supply. The only reason why Pride Month exists is because there's still a demand for it. It's like we're, we're the ones purchasing, we're the ones buying into the ideology, whether it's woke or soft woke, you know, implicit or explicit, we're surrendering to it. The only reason why you can find drugs in New York City is because people want them. Mm -hmm. And so I think what revival is, maybe we can end on this, uh, I think re revival is not remove, it's replace. You know, it's like religion removes. Religion says don't ever have sex. Yeah, it's but, holiness by subtraction. Yes. And progressivism is holiness by addition. Yeah, and the, and revivals replace. Yes. Because it's like, hey, like, it, yeah, it's in, it, interesting. It's like don't get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery, but be filled by the Spirit. And so that's a scripture about replace. Mm -hmm. It's like, hey, you want to get drunk? Be filled be intoxicated by the love of the Father, filled with the Holy Spirit. And I think a lot of the revival is like, everybody asked me, Pastor Mike, why are your stages filled with piles of drugs and paraphernalia? I said, I'm not taking them away. I'm replacing. Yeah. I'm, I'm replacing a counterfeit comfort with the comforter. Yeah. And there's something about, I, I think, you know, like I said, sexuality. It's like religion says don't have sex. And what we're saying is, no, righteously fulfill and have the most mind-blowing marital sex within that covenant yeah. that God established. Pull a hamstring ever. with your heterosexual monogamous spouse. I don't care. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Just stay in your I life. i got a goal, Julie. If, you, <laughs> if you're in the chat, Pastor yeah. Mark Watch said so. Watch Cirque du Soleil and take notes. I don't care as long as you're married <laughs> yeah, to yeah. your heterosexual <laughs> monogamous spouse. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but that's revival. Yeah. Revival is not, uh, hey, don't do, don't, don't do sex the world's way. And then we're, revival is actually like, let me show you what it could be, because the most powerful sex organ you have isn't between your, your legs, it's between your ears. Mm -hmm. it's, it's something happening in your soul, it's in your mind, and, and God liberates you, you know? Um, and so I think for me, revival means replace. Yeah. It's, it's, it's God's not trying to take anything from you without giving you something better. And so I don't know if you just want to end on maybe, I know you've talked a lot about this remnant revival, what is that to you? 
well, just final thoughts. Yeah. So, I mean, he talks about it in Elijah, you yeah. know, God, Elijah's got the, so the Elijah complex is this. I'm the only guy left. I'm the only true believer. You know, I'm Rambo. I'm, yeah, you know, yeah, it's yeah. just me. Um, and he's like, actually, I got a bunch of other dudes and yeah. you've just not met them. And, yeah. you know, I'm yeah. doing other things too. And so there's always more that love the Lord and are doing the work than you think there are. Paul quotes that line from Elijah in Romans, and he talks about a remnant. God always preserves a remnant chosen and kept by grace. So I use the analogy that sometimes what happens is like a tree will grow for a long time, produce a lot of fruit, but it needs to be pruned. Otherwise, eventually it ceases to be fruitful. Wow. So in, in, in the church, it's like we're going to cut away dead branches and sucker branches, bad programs, outdated methods, stupid doctrines, cowardly leaders. You know, we're going to prune. And when that happens, everybody's like, oh, my gosh, the church is dying. No, it's actually pruning. Pruning is very different than dying. Pruning has much hope. Dying has no hope. Wow. And the truth is, if you love something, you have to prune it for it to be healthy. Yeah. And yeah. then once you prune it, it gets smaller, but it gets stronger and it gets focused. And then all the life energy goes out to the fruitful branches. I think what we're seeing right now in Christianity, especially in the West, is a severe pruning that is long overdue. Yeah, yes. Denominational structures, yep. crummy theology, weak Bible teaching in the shallow end of the pool, guys who are in the pulpit but think it's a job and not a calling. Um, at the end of the day, and people that are working for the church that really don't have a heart for the Lord or the ministry, they're all getting pruned. Yeah. And now the soft woke pastors, they're getting exposed. And the hard woke pastors, they've just come out of Satan's closet. And so what we're getting is a severe pruning. And I'm like, praise God. Yeah. Because when you prune, you prune down to a remnant. And then God uses the remnant of the true believers, like the solid branches in a prune bush, to then have a revival and more fruitfulness. And so, you know, God's got to get the church ready before he gets the converts saved. Otherwise, you've got a bunch of believers, but no mothers and fathers, and you have a whole generation of spiritual orphans. Because right now, if massive conversions did come, churches are not ready, and what they would teach them oftentimes would not be helpful or true. Oh, this is so good. I was trying not to pollute the audio, so because that was just so rich. I, I talked to somebody once who actually does physical pruning. Yeah. And they said that you always prune back significantly more than you think you should. Sure. So it's always going to seem like you're going in too deep, but that's actually what's necessary to do the true job. And they said, if pruning ever fails, it's because you didn't prune back far enough. Yep. And so when you talk about pruning, it's like, yeah, it's going to be vicious. It's, it's going to seem very intense. And this is an individual experience. So revival is not just something that happens to a nation. It happens to a person. Yeah. And personal revival is where God does a severe pruning in you. I mean, I, I had a season of this. You know, I'd been in ministry forever. I took 18 months. I No social media. I wasn't preaching and teaching publicly. I, I gave up everything that I was doing. And it was like, and moved to another state with my family and no job severe pruning. Wow. Severe pruning. Yeah. And this is why the people that have been through the most severe pruning afterwards would say, I didn't want it. It was the worst thing that happened to me. And I thank God I wouldn't have it any other way. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And so you, you can't have fruit without pruning. And that's true, not just in a church or a denomination or a nation. That's true in an individual Christian believer. If you want to be fruitful, you got to get pruned. Yeah. Wow, that's so good. This has been one of my favorite conversations, I'll tell you. I mean, this this whole thing is just filled with with just so many gold nuggets. Um, I know it's funny, I just on a quick side note, how many times from stage people have been like, Pastor Mike, you know, how do you grow the church? And I'm like, I'm not trying to grow it, I'm actually trying to shrink it. I think about Christ. He at one moment he turns and he's like, Hey, he, he discerning their hearts. Eat and my thought, flesh, yeah, drink, drink my, my blood. blood. And they're like, He knew what dude, he was this doing. This got goth real quick. We're and, out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And what he was saying was, I wanna I wanna shrink it down to the real ones. Yeah, he got down and to I, the remnant. Yeah, he Noah's got, family was a remnant. The disciples who yes. remained after the feeding of the 5,000 are the yeah. remnant. 
Yeah. You know, those who didn't bow their knee to Baal were the remnant. Daniel and his buddies were the remnant. Yeah. It's everywhere. Yeah. And I think it's like church. I tell people all the time because pastors across America are like, how do I grow my church, Pastor so I Mike? Don't want a crowd. And I'm like, that's the wrong goal, man. Yeah. And I was like, churches are measured by the world, but they're weighed by the kingdom. Yeah. And there's churches that are smaller in numbers, but more in weight. And I'm like, I want to carry weight in New York City. I mean, being the largest, well, cancer glory, grows too. That's what glory means. Yes, I was literally just going to say that. Yeah, it means weightiness. The or weight heaviness. of the nature of a thing, you know. You know, big, small, I don't care. Heavy, light, I care a lot. That's it. That's it. Well, hey guys, I got. He's got to get to the airport soon. But let me let me show you this. I'm so I'm blessed because I got it already. It's not out yet. You it's guys. not out yet. Yeah. yeah, it's not out yet. But the link is in the description. You may be watching this video at a point where it is out. So I want you to tap the link. Go ahead and grab it. New Days, Old Demons, Pastor Mark Driscoll. Thank you so much for, yeah. for kicking it with me for so long today. We did like the marathon hangout. Yeah. <laughs> but it's great. Thank you, Yeah, buddy. so thankful. All right, guys. Hey, hit the thumbs up. Make sure you subscribe if you're new to this channel. Maybe you just caught the live stream because it was in one of your friends' feeds. Go ahead and hit the subscribe and then ring the bell notification so every time I go live, you see it. And I can't wait to see you guys in the next teaching. And then, hey, last thing you do, hit the links in the description, jump over, grab the book, subscribe to his channel. And you got a lot of binge watching to do right now. Love you guys.